There are two kinds of people in the world, those who read instruction manuals and those who don't. How many of you read uh, the how-to manual when you're trying to fix something or, or make something or, or put something together? Guilty. <laughs> Here are some examples of some fun instructions. On the new pet shampoo, remember to eliminate all escape routes well in advance. Once your pet is slippery wet, he or she is suddenly smarter and faster than you are. Here are some instructions for applying lotion. After showering, apply generously onto any skin that evokes warm, scaly memories of the pet iguana that your cousin Danny had in the seventh grade. Here are some helpful instructions on a shirt. For best results, machine wash cold, tumble dry low. For worst results, drag through a puddle behind car, blow dry on roof rack. And then here are some super accurate soup instructions. Lift up and pull to remove lid. Immediately slice fingertip on edge of lid. Throw lid very hard in the garbage can so it knows what it's done. Laugh at portion of directions regarding stove. Dump cold glop into microwave safe bowl. Lose appetite. Microwave until scalding on the edges and freezing in the middle. Stir until lukewarm throughout. Ignore soup coated walls of microwave forever. <laughs> it's so important for us to know how to fix the food or, or how to wash the clothes or how to use the cable remote. But how much more important it is for us to know how to have faith in God and how to grow in our faith. Last time we spent a good deal of time on why, why unity and why this for the church. And over the years, we've likely all spent a, a lot of time on what, what we're all about. But today we're drawn back to the fourth chapter of Ephesians because this letter is Paul's how-to manual for the church. Read with me Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, and then verse 15. <clears throat> Therefore I... The prisoner of the Lord implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Paul's main how-to for the church is from these verses, and, and this is it. Here's the how-to idea. Let's grow up together. Let's grow up together with the attitude of Jesus, in the unity of the Spirit, and speaking the truth about God in love. Did you ever have to do a group project in school? In a way, the body of Christ coming to maturity is a group project but it's the best kind of group project. You recall that group projects could be either the best of times or the worst of times, depending on who was in your group. It's like our group, which is Christ's body, is preparing for the final exam and each of us knows the answer to several questions, but we all get to take the test together. When we each contribute our answers, we all get a perfect score. What do you say? Let's grow up together. <laughs> How? First of all, with the attitude of Jesus. Verse 2 says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Wow, this, this term, with all humility, I'm pretty sure it means be completely humble. This is a, a focus on our, our thinking. It's, it's the mindset to think lowly of ourselves and highly of Christ. It really requires us to renounce all self-centeredness. If we're growing in humility, we're learning to hold loosely what is ours, and we don't grasp onto what is not ours. Look at Christ's attitude. 
the best place to do that is in Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Friends, we need to be emptying ourselves as well, and then being continually filled with his Holy Spirit. As a result, our humble obedience will bring worship to our King and unity to his body. Well, Paul also talks about the uh, gentleness that comes with humility, sometimes translated meekness. It's the opposite of self-assertion. You know, someone has said that humility expresses itself in gentleness. The gentle person needs to renounce harshness and violence. But gentleness is not weakness. Remember, our gentle Savior flipped tables and confronted hypocrisy. Our high calling does not justify a high and mighty attitude. Because in our former condition as lost sinners, we, we were no different than anyone else. And now in Christ, we are righteous and forgiven only because of what he has done. The grace of God in our lives should produce humility and gratitude, not pride. But then Paul talks about patience. Patience showing tolerance for one another in love. Someone has said that this is the spirit which bears insult and injury without bitterness. It can bear the sheer foolishness of men without irritation and suffer unpleasant people with graciousness. Wow. That's patience. (laughs) However, it is not overlooking sin and, and allowing division and dysfunction in the church. We who are growing in patience need to renounce the tyranny of our own agendas and our own timetable. Those of you who are parenting children, keep up the good work. Be consistent, be firm, be loving, and be grateful you're not parenting adult children. Ooh la la la. (laughs) Talk about the need for patience. But the idea of showing tolerance here, it's, it's forbearing, it's enduring, literally putting up with each other in love. Aren't you glad Paul said that we have to put up with one another? This really frees us from the, the hypocritical need to think that we're perfect. Perfect people don't need to be endured or forgiven. <laughs> but as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, God has blended together the body, giving greater honor to the lesser member, so that there may be no division in the body, but the members may have mutual concern one for another. Friends, how is our mindset? How is our attitude? We might be inclined to give ourselves a passing grade on this issue. But the real question is this. How is my mindset in my relationship with my mom, with my dad? What is my attitude toward my boss, my teacher, my coworker, toward my Christian sister or brother? We deceive ourselves if we think we're living humbly, gently, and patiently when we're really simply avoiding people and thereby avoiding conflict. This is a huge challenge these days because whether because of a fear of sickness or fear of rejection or cancellation, or just not wanting to rock the boat. Most of us are not pursuing relationships old or new. I recently heard on a podcast, a a Christian leader confessed the relief he's felt when a meeting or an appointment was canceled so that he could just go home and be alone. Is that how you're feeling these days? I confess to sometimes having that exact same feeling. But when we are together and and there's a difference of opinion about religion or politics or sports, what should our attitude be? Are we able to put up with that? Can we keep the conversation light or do we feel that we need to dump on someone? Or what if someone in the group is responding harshly to our idea? 
can we respond gently in an effort to diffuse the tension? I totally get not wanting to submit ourselves to a toxic person or situation. But what about when a brother or sister in the body of Christ is really struggling? Who will care for the body if the individual members don't? Let's grow up together. In the attitude of Jesus and in the unity of the Spirit, Verse 3 says, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What is unity again? Unity is, is both the method and the goal of maturity. This unity that I'm talking about has come from outside of ourselves. We had nothing to do with creating it or defining it. It was given to us by God. What we need to do is to humbly recognize it, delight in it, and live it out. This is living up to our call and staying together along the way while we, while we walk toward the goal of maturity in Christ. The phrase being diligent here is making every effort. Romans 12, 18 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. Friends, preserving unity is a lot of work. It isn't a one-day seminar or a weekend project. Eugene Peterson, I think, he was the one who called it a long obedience in the same direction. It's not a sprint. It's a full-length marathon. Making every effort may be actual physical labor, serving others in some way. It may be knowing what to say and when to say it. But it also might be knowing when to keep my mouth shut and actually doing it. One commentator by the name of Klein, Klein Snodgrass, he pokes us with this. He says, so often Christianity is presented as if nothing is required of believers. We place so much emphasis on human weakness, on our inability to do anything profitable, and on the necessity of God's actions in salvation, that no room is left for human response or responsibility. The New Testament never gives this impression. He goes on to say, our problem is that we have a million dollar salvation and a five cent response. We seem unimpressed with God's salvation. We protest that no one can actually live worthy of this calling and we express our fears of perfectionism. Friends, Paul is concerned that together we're making progress toward maturity in Christ. And he uses the imagery of a body a physical body, to illustrate this oneness. We get some great clues from verse 16, which says, From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Well, Number one, we rely on Christ as the source of growth, right? Both, both our love and our truth flow from him. Number two, all of us cause all of us to grow. Yes, there's a big part that God does, but there are also parts that we do, all of us together, using the gifts that he has given. The body, number three, the body makes growth happen by being connected the original words are joined and knit together through every joint for supply. And one way to, to follow this idea is that a joint may be every place of connection from part to part in the body. In other words, the knee bones connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bones connected to the hip bone, and so on. So growth happens through these points of contact together. And the building up of our body happens through our connectedness together. Okay, number four. Each of us have gifts and abilities and skills and so on. Everything that we have and all that we are are gifts from God. Christ has given to each of us as he sees fit in his great wisdom. And now it is up to each of us as individuals to have a part in the body of Christ. If one or more of us is not taking part, not being intimately connected with the others, then we all suffer because of it. It's all done 
in love. This is how God designed his body to work. Let's grow up together. The third way we do that is by speaking the truth in love. Verse 15 says this, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love, this could be translated speaking, and sometimes is, sometimes translated practicing, practicing the truth in love. The word actually is a verb. We don't normally say truthing in love, but there it is. Truth as a verb. Uh, This is actually speaking the truth about God, about Christ, about the gospel. The point is that both love and truth need to be present. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8 that truth without love puffs up. And I think that's why he prays in Philippians, uh, Philippians 1.9, that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and discernment. Love filled with knowledge and discernment is what builds the body of Christ. The thing is, if we only have truth, then we're just abrasive and cold. The other person is actually not going to hear the truth that we have to say, and they will likely harden their hearts against us. On the other hand, if we only have love, then our message is confused and aimless, and it just disintegrates into sentimental mush. We're not really loving the other person well without the truth. But because we're all so messed up, nobody is capable of mixing truth and love in the balance that we need. Oh, this is why we so desperately need humility expressing itself in gentleness and patiently putting up with each other in love. We desperately need God's help. Speaking the truth in love is actually way more than speaking hard words to one another with loving hearts. As in, hey, buddy, you really have bad breath, but since I love you, I've got to speak the truth to you. Or, hey, we want you in our group, but you just aren't very nice to others, so people don't want to be around you. (laughs) Hey, I'm just speaking the truth in love. Paul is talking about way more here. Paul knows that if People are going to grow up into Christ in every way. They need to hear the truths of Jesus and learn to speak the truths of Jesus into everything, every day, in every way. What does the gospel of Jesus teach us about how to handle our money? Well, financial principles abound in God's word. It was one of Jesus' favorite topics. How should we deal with relational conflict in light of the gospel? Certainly Jesus, the Prince of Peace, can bring wisdom into such a tense situation. How does what we know about Jesus shape how we handle our anxieties and our fears? Christ's life and teaching meet us right where we are in this very moment. If we speak the truth about Jesus into each of these issues, each of these situations, we will grow up together in every way with Christ, which also means we will grow up in every way into Christ, our head. What an amazing plan by our wise God. Hey, one more question for you. What would you call a group of people who all speak the same language, but other than that, they're all very different from each other? Some are rich, some are poor. They come from different ethnic backgrounds. Maybe some are small business owners, some work the assembly line, some are unemployed. They're young, they're old, and on and on. But they're all growing in humility and gentleness. Each one is working on being patient to the point of bending over backwards for the others, and they're all committed to growing together. They're getting better and better at getting real and being truthful with each other and with themselves. And they're becoming experts at bringing the good news of Jesus into their everyday lives. In fact, their favorite thing to do is to be together to figure out how to get more people into their group. What would you call a group like that? I would call that group a healthy church. 
Friends, no matter where you are with your walk with Christ today, no matter where we are as a church, God's call is still echoing out to us. Let's grow up together for the honor and glory of King Jesus.